Hello again. Let's talk about quantity theory of money. Now, there are three approaches to quantity theory of money. One is love with full forgiveness. The other one is hate without any forgiveness. And then there is a third one, which could be reflected in Hayek's statement. Hayek said that overall, in the long run, he may agree with the quantity theory of money. The argument that I would like to make in this presentation is that the quantity theory of money still remains one of the essential features of proper macroeconomic reasoning. At the same time, as we know from many Austrian critics, it has its limitations, it has its problems. And of course, you, you have to add a lot in monetary reasoning to quantity theory of money. However, <clears throat> if you want to explain, for example, current inflation levels in many countries, not only Poland, but of course, United States, Eurozone, etc., you have to rely on some form of reasoning that is based on the quantity theory of money. Let's start then with the restatement. You can restate quantity theory of money um, either using typical verbal reasoning by saying that uh, when you add additional monetary units into cash balances, this influences marginal utility of money, this influences the spending pattern, the spending pattern, and this influences the exchange ratios between the goods according to preferences of individuals holding the money. You can, at the same time, rely on what we know Fisher equation, or to be precise, Rao Fisher equation, which states that simply money spent equals money received. Right on the left side, as many of you know, we have money supply multiplied by the so-called velocity of money, uh, a variable that is kind of tricky. And on the other side, you have nominal income, what is being received in spending, sometimes separated into two variables, P, the price level, and Q, which represents real income or real production. Now, when you apply real-world data, it gets tricky. As many of you know, people say that you could add GDP there, but we know that that's not all because a lot of money is being spent on goods which are not counted in the GDP. Also, you can see in Rothbard's criticism that using just one general equation might be problematic. We could disaggregate it further into individual transactions and so forth and so forth. Now, the point of my presentation is not to go into that, those details, but there is one good purpose for this type of illustration for Rao Fisher equation. It's the fact that you can uh, explain the price level in terms of two variables, the so-called real factors and monetary factors, or actually three variables, right? Because the price level ultimately depends on three things. First, money supply, that is how much nominally monetary units we have uh, in the economy in cash balances of the people. The second V represents imperfectly or tautologically represents um, the demand for money by money holders. So people who already hold the money decide based on their preferences how fast they want to reduce their cash balances. And then there is the second aspect of demand for money, which is real production uh, in the denominator, Q which represents the idea that uh, when you have sellers of goods and services that offer those goods and services in, in the market, they increase their demand for money as money not holders yet. Right? They want to become money holders, so they have to offer, offer something in exchange. And this type of formulation, uh, again, has its limitations, but it's, it serves a good purpose to show us that we have those three things that we always have to consider when we think about the price level. Now... <clears throat> We have this um, nice meta-analysis. The force is strong with this one, of course. Lucas is not, it's a coincidence in names because this is Robert Lucas. On the left side, uh, this is from the famous uh, Nobel lecture. Robert Lucas said basically that this is one of the most important theorems in macroeconomic thinking, quantity theory of money, which he formulated as the statement that when you have money growth in the long run, it determines in the long run the inflation rate. And you have nice 45 degree line. This is based on M2, by the way, and it comes from this presentation uh, from the paper McLandis and Weber. 
Uh, and they basically have a better explanation here. We have 110 countries, uh, analysis going from the 60s to 90s. Very, very nice broad meta-analysis of different data in different places. And again, this is the same graph. So obviously you have this 45 degrees line. So we have a clear demonstration. Hey, there is a, um, there is a uh, proven in the empirical data relation between money supply and the price level on the other hand. Moving on, <clears throat> we have something that appeared uh, after Second World War and is being associated with uh, Milton Friedman, his idea for monetary stability. He even loved it so much that he wanted to basically have highly regulated banking sector so that the banking sector would adapt to uh, his planning scheme for the monetary policy. And that would basically be it, this. Uh, increase M, so money supply and circulation, Increase it with stable pace, similar to economic growth, real growth, to keep inflation low and stable. Because when you have those two variables, um, that is money supply increasing at the same pace as real production increased, P should stay stable. Of course, assuming that uh, V is stable in there, right? And that's the crucial part of, uh, of his dream. And for many thinkers, many economists, uh, a next level in the development of the quantity theory of money was Milton Friedman's program, which is a mistake because it's not the same thing. An offspring is not the same the thing as the father. And the same applies here. Of course, Friedman's reasoning is based on the quantity theory of money, but this is not quantity theory of money per se. Uh, as the time went by, the dream had to fade away for the simple reason that the so-called velocity of money was not stable. Uh, there's, it's of course a little bit tricky how we calculate velocity because we do it uh, simply by taking nominal income and dividing it by the money supply that we choose to track and to plan and to target. So you cannot really measure it when you make a decision, but exposed when you analyze the data, for example, last five, 10, 30 years, and you, for example, make an argument, we should target this money this money aggregate, you can compare it to nominal income, and if, if that, uh, that comparison remains stable, you could say that sort of you're just targeting one variable. But if it changes, like we have it here, this is uh, for M1 velocity, and this is for M2 velocity. Uh, it was realized in the 80s that M1 velocity dropped dramatically. Then Friedman, by the way, said, okay, let's switch to M2 then. And then M2 velocity uh, broken down in the 90s, right? So another aggregate could not really be targeted according to his scheme. So he had to drop his dream. And then it, it was interpreted, ah, we have another coffin, uh, another nail in the coffin in the quantity theory of money. Moreover, there was a uh, demonstration that that nice graph that I showed you, it nicely applies to 110 countries and 30-year period only when you include countries with high inflation rates. When you do the same type of correlation analysis for the countries that have uh, that has lower inflation rate, below 12%, below 10%, single-digit inflation, then suddenly the relationship doesn't look the same. We don't have 45 degrees line suddenly. And apparently, another proof, quantity theory of, theory of money is not really working in here. And so, part of the reason why we have the so-called monetary policy without money comes from exactly this fact. Some popularizers of economics of monetary policy make an argument, hey, the central bankers do not know what the amount of money in circulation is. You can read it in many popular outlets, you can read it on Twitter and so on and so on, which is a mistake. It's not that they do not, do not know these statistics. They perfectly know them because we have full uh, basically full regulatory control over the banking sector. The thing is that they, they cannot really separate operationally the, the, the definition of the money, the particular target uh, of aggregated money uh, according to some definition, which would work operationally with the variables that they want to target. In other words, the so-called policy of direct inflation targeting, what we have in Poland 2.5%, what we have in the Eurozone 2%, cannot be operationally and efficiently based on any particular 
chosen definition of money supply, because if you choose one, then the velocity may change, you might have adaptations, financial innovations, and so on, and it would be basically counterproductive, right? That's the argument. That's why we have the so-called monetary policy without money. That's why we have inflation targeting based on something else, on various proxies uh, that are supposed to work with the monetary transmission mechanism. Moreover, <clears throat> we have another so-called nail in the coffin in the quantity theory of money, which is the case of 2008. Right? In 2008, we, have, we had huge interventions in monetary policy, uh, unprecedented basically, huge expansion in the balance sheet of the Fed, and not only Fed, of course, Bank of Japan, uh, European Central Bank, and so forth, <clears throat> huge expansion, doubling uh, 2.5 more of the monetary base in 2008. At that time, there were many economists making an argument, we're going to have hyperinflation <clears throat> because we have huge monetary printing by the central bank. And if we have monetary printing, we're going to see very, very high levels of inflation, 10, 20, 30 percent. Some people were even, were even making an argument, famous gold investors making an argument that the dollar will go down, right? It will be the worst currency now, whereas that was the time of the reversal and dollar started to appreciate during the massive liquidation around the world. In any case, this is a misunderstanding for the simple reason. This is just a monetary base. And the quantity theory of money, at least since Ludwig von Mises' interpretation, uh, relies not only on the monetary base. By the way, he was superior to Irving Fisher in this, that he realized that you need broader measures of money supply when you want to analyze what's going on inflationary in the economy. So in any case, nowadays, when you want to talk about inflationary aspect of increasing money supply, you cannot focus on the monetary base because monetary base is a small part, and not even whole of it, but it's a much, much smaller part of the whole quantity theory, uh, of the whole quantity of money in that is being used in transactions. And as you see, by the way, uh, so it may appear that this increase in the money supply in 2008, in monetary base in 2008, was way bigger than it was a year ago and two years ago during COVID times, during pandemic times, right? And some people were even making an argument that at that time, a year or two years ago, it's not gonna be inflationary. Come on, I mean, we did it before in 2008, it didn't happen. Quantitative view of money is dead. Right? So the quantity doesn't matter. So let's dehomogenize three things, because we are talking about three different aspects in here. One element is quantity theory of money interpreted as the way, the way I presented it to you in the very beginning, which is relevant since the beginning of economics in general. Right? If you want to think that economics started in the 18th century, like typical separated economic science, it basically started with quantity theory of money, right? And, and the explanations that you had, slightly differing, but aiming at the similar, broadly similar uh, goal in Cantillon and Hume was this, this price uh, specie flow mechanism, right? That increases in the money supply are leading to a, a price adaptations that they, only, they influence not only interest rates and pure spending, they also influence prices overall. And you have to always account for that. So this started, we have this quantity theory, it was presented in the Ralph Fisher equation, it has its place, it's a general theorem, but this has not been rejected and uh, falsified in any way. Then we have a second thing that appears in here, a monetarist project and monetarist dream that using the notion of quantity theory of money, you're planning to set up a particular monetary policy. That is, you increase the money supply with the same pace as reproduction in order to reach certain price levels. Right? But, but this, is, this is just a normative program which requires many additional assumptions which are incorrect overall and which neglect many important negative effects associated with increases in the money supply. But they're definitely not the same thing, right? This is, this is a separate, as I said, this is an offspring of quantity theory. It's not quantity theory itself. So even though it was falsified by the data and by reality, for a variety of reasons, some of those reasons are accepted by mainstream economists, some are not. But even though it's falsified, it's not, um, it's not the falsification of this, the rejection of this, the criticism of this, doesn't mean that quantity theory doesn't apply at all. And then there is a third element, 
which is money multiplier monetary transmission mechanism. Again, even more often associated with the quantity theory of money. Money multiplier mechanism is the thing you learn at basic macroeconomics. Right? It, it, it's also presented in some Austrian textbooks. Right? That is when you increase M0 or monetary base, it leads to increases in, in banks' expansions and increases money supply in circulation. And this was uh, the theorem, the, the, this idea of monetary multiplier um, uh, transmission mechanism was based in those interpretations in 2008. And it came out to be not true, right? You can have circumstances in which you add additional reserves into the banking system and the banks do not automatically, deterministically respond to it through increases in credit and in broader measures of the money supply. Uh, but then again, this is an offspring of the quantity theory or something supple supplementing it even. And when you reject it, you show that it's not consistent with the empirical data. Again, it doesn't throw out uh, the baby with the bathwater, right? It doesn't mean that uh, quantity theory is falsified. It just means that money multiplier mechanism, um, a monetary transmission mechanism, money multiplier, is not properly, it's not as easy as we think at least, or it might even be broken down completely. But then again, you can reject the idea that banks automatically expand the money supply after monetary base is expanded. And at the same time, make an argument, but hey, that doesn't reject or violate quantity theory of money. <clears throat> and when you look at um, broader measures of money supply, uh, for example, M2 and M3 in the United States, you see the difference between 2008 and what was going on a year ago and two years ago. A clear, startling difference. You can barely see increases in the money supply with M2 and M3 compared, for example, to what was going on in the early 2000s, right? After 2001, 2002, with the Greenspan, so-called so Greenspan bubble, right? There, there is no big difference. And when you compare it to what was going on recently, there you go, a clear spike, right? We have significant increases in the quantity of money understood in the broader way than just monetary base. Now, one of the things <clears throat> I would like to emphasize is that I am not defending any particular measure of uh, money supply. I think it's really hard to make a strict, objective, uh, very, very universally applicable definition of the money supply. Because, because we have human adaptations, we have some form of institutional changes that can lead to changes in human preferences. So it's really hard to find one measure that could work universally for all the countries and for all the time. Right? So it, it is, in a way, some form of Verstehen historical analysis. <clears throat> Excuse me when you want to measure quantity, uh, quantity of money in circulation. However, no matter how you disagree with this, whether you want to make an argument, oh, M2 is better than M3, or M2A is better, or whatever, or in different country there is a different definition. However you want to approach it, one thing is for certain, M0 is not money supply. Okay? Definitely need a broader measure, and whichever broader measure you take, by the way, uh, in comparison of 2008 and what was going on recently, you will see the spike. Right? And you will see in most of the countries that experience high inflation now. <clears throat> um, moreover, um, when you take, I, I showed you the data from TELUS uh, where the relationship apparently between um, quantity of money defined as M2 and the price level, it broken down with single digit inflation. However, what TELUS interestingly did, they, they adjusted for two more things. One, real production, which is not a surprise because as you remember my first slide, I said that price level is dependent not only on the quantity theory, and not only on the quantity of money, sorry, but it also, it's also dependent on velocity of circulation, or actually it's dependent on monetary demand which includes the willingness to spend faster or, or slower on part of money holders and the willingness to buy that money on part of sellers of goods and services. So when you try to find correlations between money supply, some particular measure and the price level, you have to somehow focus also on the so-called velocity 
on circulation, of circulation and on real production. You just have to include it, right? And uh, if you don't include it in some way at very high levels of inflation, 12, 15, 20, 30 percent, then it's negligible, right? And then those two variables are much less important. But if you go to single digit inflation, you go to below 10 percent, 9, 7, 5 percent, then apparently those two variables play their role. And what Teles did, they did the adjustment, they adjusted for real production, and they, um, they used a um, so-called uh, Baumol, Tobin, Miller, Orr model with portfolio adjustments, it, which was supposed to reflect velocity of money. It's, it was not a perfect way, but at least it, it corrected to some extent for that velocity variable. And when they did this, we're back again at 45 degrees line. There is again, empirically nicely shown, illustrated relationship between corrected money growth and inflation level. Um, their relationship that they showed broke down again at four and below 4%. Uh, that is when we are closer to central banks, um, central banks goal uh, for inflation targeting, direct inflation targeting, right? And you can easily, when you are at four, three, two percent, you can easily explain it with measurement problems. And also you can simply explain it by variability in inflation, inflation expectations that, that people can further adjust their spending according to this predefined monetary policy, right? And this influences, of course, again, prices, uh, the expectations in the, in the shorter run. And so, um, to summarize, um, uh, tracking planning problem versus causality, right? Because this is basically what we are faced with. Just because we cannot measure, it doesn't follow that there is no relationship. Right? That's the crucial argument that we should make here. Right? Just because Friedman's program for monetary policy failed for a variety of reasons, it doesn't mean that quantity theorem, theory of money that he used, theory with which he was associated, uh, it doesn't mean that it's incorrect, right? at least uh, uh, not broadly understood. There are problems with it. However, when we want to explain inflationary times, especially suddenly the times that we are living in right now, you have to rely on the quantity theory itself. Henceforth, um, the, 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 initial, the initial title of my lecture was quantity theory of money, dead and well. Right? Meaning, dead meaning that it's not operationally used in monetary policy. It's not used right now in direct inflation targeting. It's also not being properly respected by many economists, especially working with the empirical data. However, it is okay. It's feeling quite well, the quantity theory, because it nicely explains the current times of very, very high inflation. Um, thank you. And um, I'll have questions now. <laughs> I hope my question is very simple. Why can you measure the velocity of the money supply? How do you propose to measure it? By the statements of the certain central banks in terms of the... Where do they get those statements from? They should create it as the... Create, of the create what? They, I mean, creation of money is one thing, but trying to foresee how often people will spend it is another thing. You can measure it in a way, as I said, exposed tautologically, but that's not operationally meaningful when you want to target projected data, right? That's correct. Thanks. You're welcome. But the, generally, the receivers of the money from the central banks are limited. Then there is a, some kind of a procedure of the money distribution in the market. Can't we just track the specific pinpoints in the process just to track the velocity? Well, if you want to track velocity of narrow money supply, monetary base, there is still an element what you do with it, with those reserves. Even, even that could be hard to predict. But, but then who cares about 5 or 7 or 10? at most 10% of the money supply in circulation. 
What matters is broad money supply that includes spending by all the individuals, households, companies in the economy. Right? This is this is that actually this is the crucial variable that influences the price level, not the amount of reserves created in the narrow banking system. Thank you. All right. Yep. So uh, I have one question related maybe more to this article from Tails. Yeah. I just wonder if they also check uh, this adjusted model with the portfolio and price level to this initial data with the high inflation rate. Whether that works for this set as well or they don't think about this. And the second question maybe, to which group of this, of this three group of economists belongs Professor Mahan in terms of Quantity. 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 Right. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, very good questions. Uh, the, uh, tell, I, I'm not sure they adjusted for that initial data, and probably they. I wouldn't say there was any reason, right? Because if if uh, you have, for example, quantity um, quantity of money increasing by 30, 40 percent, 50 percent, and you see the price level tracking it quite nicely after a while. Uh, and at the same time, real product grew by 3%, for example. It's not very, it's not even very much interesting uh, to, to correct for it. But yeah, that, that would be, I don't think they did that, but that, that would be a good thing to do, good point. Uh, whereas about quantity theory of money, I, I agree with Hayek that uh, it's an important macroeconomic theorem. Um, money is not, is not neutral. Uh, uh, in the short run or in the long run. Uh, however, um, you, can, you can definitely track the, relation, the relationship like it was presented by Hume and, and classical economists, meaning as you increase the amount of money in circulation, it, it boosts the price level. Yes, I heard that. Yeah, no, I think it works. Uh, it might not be recorded, so I'll repeat it quickly uh, for recording purposes. The question was whether quantity theory of money uh, focuses on uh, how money is being spent in particular markets. And the answer is that it does not uh, in its general form, because in its general form, it's focused on the aggregates, how increases in the money supply in general lead to increases in prices. Therefore, quantity theory, theory of money has to be uh, supplemented by additional considerations. Uh, the considerations that started at the same time, roughly, when quantity theory of money started, uh, considerations present in, for example, Richard Cantillon's analysis, right? Uh, then you can focus how money changes particular markets first, and then later on it, it, it appears this increased money in the form of increased price level, right? But on the way, you might have various adjustments on local markets or on particular, particular industries, something which is, of course, subject of extensive analysis in, in the works of the Austrian School. I left so much time for questions. Um, I was wondering how Bitcoin fits into this uh, theory of money. Wow, that's a, a very general question. <laughs> um, how, how you mean uh, to quantity theory of money, for example? Yes. Okay, okay. 
uh, how Bitcoin relates to quantity theory of money. Uh, you know, the, the person who constructed, uh, the people who constructed uh, Bitcoin uh, apparently uh, had knowledge, at least according to the emails that they exchange that are publicly av available, um, they uh, were aware of the quantity uh, effect. Therefore, they planned that Bitcoin will not increase in pace and you will have increases in the quantity that will be smaller and smaller and smaller until, until you reach certain level of Bitcoins and then you cannot create more of them, right? So the person who, um, the people who, who worked on it, because it's probably more than one person, they, uh, they knew about this inflationary effect of increases in the money and therefore they try to establish the rules in this synthetic money so that it's not progressively increased like it's being increased in the current monetary framework. Now maybe a silly question, but how do we measure the production? What's the unit? Uh, we do it with uh, the so-called real GDP, right? So we measure GDP, uh, current production in all the industries. We look at the industries that we have, we see what the levels of production are, and uh, we take the nominal value of them and we make the adjustment uh, to the so-called deflator or sort of like local deflators, meaning we compare how much prices grew according to, to the time, and, and we correct it for this. And, and when we correct for this, we see that, for example, it went up nominally by 20%, but then when you include the inflationary thing, you, you adjust the discounted by the inflation, you see that it grew, for example, by 4%. And this is how you do it for the whole economy, and then you have the average, which says, for example, that real, real product grew by 4%, therefore, you should include it in the equation. Although there is immediately the problem that I just briefly mentioned, is the fact that GDP only includes part of the goods that are being sold in the market, uh, whereas in the economy, spending goes not only on final goods, the so-called final goods, it also goes for intermediate goods, right? So this is where... How, how about services and trade? Yes, services, the same thing. They are also included, right? Services, uh, when they are final goods especially, right? If, if you go to a hairdresser or... or uh, physiotherapist, uh, or a doctor, or a lawyer, it's all included. Yeah. Uh, I have a question regarding these uh, equations that you used, uh, I mean, the Fischer equation. Uh, the thing that, that is not clear for me is uh, unit measurements, because I looked into this equation, just quickly googled it, and it doesn't add up in my head. We have, like, time on one part of the equation and nothing related to time in other part of the equation, how we even can compare these things, how we can state that it's equal. Uh, it, it works. The dimensions there are working. It's just they, they might look funny, but, but uh, they work there because you have, you have money on one side and you have money on the other side. Well, uh, you have money, but you have velocity of money. Which units are used for velocity of money? As far as I understand, it has some time component which is not uh, exist with that, which doesn't exist on the right side of the equation. Uh, you, you might say that you also have time uh, in the real product, because it's the amount of goods produced within one year, and this is the average amount the money changes hands in one year. Ah, okay, good. Right. I think we have just for one more honorary question. Thank you. Uh, where do you think the uh, your opinion that the quantity theory of money is dead? Where is it? Where is it strongest? Is it journalists or is it uh, people doing uh, running central banks? Or, uh, Paul Krugman. <laughs> <laughs> I would, that would be my impression that that uh, he really wants to reject it all the time and and focus our intention on something else you know inflation is not the result of of inflationary monetary policy not a monetary policy not at all it's the result of greedy businessmen high margins meat producers collusion oligopolies everything except monetary policy and aggressive fiscal policy financed by uh, by aggressive monetary policy 
anything that directs the attention, right? So I would find it's more, more of an activism in general, because in academia, the, 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 the approach, at least the way I read the literature and interpret the literature, is that they, they have this approach, oh, it doesn't, you know, it's, it doesn't work for planning purposes, it's not correlating nicely with the data that we use for, that, for direct inflation targeting, henceforth, let's not really pay that much attention to it. Woodford, who is considered sort of like a godfather of current monetary policy, I think in one of the places he wrote something like, yeah, we know it's true because it's a tautology, but it's not. Let's not just waste the time for it. Because, because exposed, you will always find that higher, more money will have, will have higher prices with more money. But it's not, it doesn't help us much in designing proper direct inflation targeting. How, how strong is Krugmanism in Poland? I don't know. <laughs> Um, but um, but, but I, my impression would be that uh, in, in, in uh, Polish economists are sort of would be, but that's just my guess, right? That statistically uh, they would be more sympathetic to quantity theory than, uh, than American economists in general. But that could be a flawed, uh, flawed uh, impression. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think thank you. we're starting.